Good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Hall. I'm in Rapid City. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on, uh, welcome all of you on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council, which produces the annual Festival of Books. We are so very pleased to have you here for our virtual 2020 event. Before this, all of this gets underway, though, I have to do some housekeeping. Um, if you guys out there would like to ask a question or share comments with today's presenters, you can either put them in the chat, which um, if you go to the bottom of your screen is like a little conversation bubble. If you click on that, um, you can then type in your questions. Um, and also at the end of the presentation, if, if there's time after Paul finishes, we'll allow you to turn on your own audio and video. And so you can ask your questions directly if you have some. Um, in addition to attending the festival presentations like this one, we invite you to visit our virtual exhibitors hall, uh, which is on the South Dakota Humanities Council uh, Facebook page. And there you can learn about uh, lots of other authors, publishers, and cultural organizations in the state, and you can also win some prizes. So, you know, be sure to go over there, check that out. You can buy books by our presenting authors at Zambro's Varieties Special Online Festival Bookstore, zambros.com. Uh, you'll find uh, buttons at the sdbookfestival.com website that will take you directly to, to the booksellers. And there's also uh, a link in the chat that I've already posted. Um, to help continue to improve the festival, we'd really appreciate it if you guys would all fill out an evaluation form. You'll get a, an email um, containing a link to the form at the conclusion of the festival, and I've also put one in the, a, a link in the chat today if you'd like to do that right now uh, at the end of this session. Finally, you can help keep the festival free by making a tax deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. Just go to our website, sdhumanities.org, and click on the donate button. And please, please do that if you think of it. Um, this festival would not be possible without the generous support of the numerous organizations and individuals who have already donated and are acknowledged on the back of our festival guide. So check those out. And when you visit those businesses, please thank them. Um, and now that's all the housekeeping I have. So here we go, on with the show. This program is called Doolittle Raider Don Smith uh, from SDSU to World War II. And let me introduce the author, Paul Higby. Paul is a historian, an author, and a retired educator, but he may be best known as a South Dakota Magazine feature writer and columnist. His most recent book, The First Strike, expo explores the life and the World War II heroics of Doolittle Raider Don Smith. A recipi recipient of the 2000 South Dakota Author of the Year designation and the 2001 Governor's Award for History, Higby holds degrees from Black Hills State University and the University of Notre Dame. Go Irish. He and his wife, Janet, live in Spearfish. And I will turn it over to you, Paul. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, really a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful for everybody who is uh, tuning in this morning. Why uh, a book, a biography about uh, Don Smith? Um, Don was uh, one of the first South Dakotans to make a real mark for himself during World War II. He was one of the pilots who flew the famous Doolittle Raid in April of 1942. And that was four months after Japan had hit uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, 15, excuse me, 16 B-25 planes, one of them piloted by Don Smith, hit the Japanese mainland. And uh, it was the, the famous Doolittle Raid led by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. Um, there was actually another South Dakotan who was part of that raid too. The navigator for uh, uh, Doolittle was uh, Hank Potter of Pier. And if you read, read my book, you'll find a little bit, of, a little bit about uh, Mr. Potter too, but it is a biography of Don Smith and we're gonna really focus on, on Don today. But uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the early uh, months of World War II, for this strike against Japan to happen only four months after uh, Pearl Harbor was a huge morale boost 
for the United States. It suddenly seemed possible that uh, the United States could have, have victory uh, in uh, the Pacific, although it would be a long time coming. And before that, it really seemed impossible. It was just a string of defeats across the Pacific. Um, and uh, so as much as a morale booster for Americans as this was, it was also uh, a real, a real uh, morale breaker for the Japanese because their island had not been invaded in more than 2000 years. And for them to think that, hey, by air, uh, we can be attacked in this modern world was stunning. And uh, in fact, their angst about that really forced the Japanese military to stop expanding across the Pacific so aggressively and draw the forces in closer to the home island uh, as protection. Um, I uh, first proposed this book to the uh, State Historical Society Press, boy, I think in 2004, 2005, uh, Nancy Tystead Koppel was on board right away. Uh, I got to work with editor Mike Burns over there, publicist uh, Jennifer McIntyre, who arranged these uh, photos that we're looking at today. And it was just a real pleasure. As I said, the book came out about a year ago. Well, today I want to talk about Don Smith uh, and his connection to South Dakota State University which he knew as South Dakota State College. Uh, it was a, a very significant place. And I think we can look at some of the experiences that he had at SDSU and we can uh, see how it really impacted him as he flew his mission in 1942. Um, of course, he would not know the, the initials SDSU. For him, it was SD, uh, SC, South Dakota State College. And uh, I wanna show you what Don looked like when he arrived on campus in uh, September 1936. He had just graduated from Belfouche High School, and uh, that, in fact, is his Belfouche High School senior portrait. Um, came from Belfouche, but he had actually been born uh, pretty close to Brookings at Oldham, South Dakota. But uh, his mother died when he was young, and then his family uh, was broken up, and he ended up being adopted by uh, uh, veterinarian, Arthur Smith. Uh, Laura Smith became his adopted mom, and they moved to Belfouche, where Dr. Smith started his uh, veterinary practice. Now, Don, by the time he went back East River to SDSC, he was a dyed-in-the-wool West River kid. He uh, loved the ranch country, open range, north of uh, Belfouche, where his dad worked as a veterinarian. He loved the Black Hills, especially Spearfish Canyon. And especially, he loved rodeo. And he was a participant in all the kids' events growing up at the uh, famous Black Hills Roundup in Belfouche every July 4th. Um, but nonetheless, he decided to go East River to college. And uh, there are really three reasons he went uh, to Brookings. Uh, first was he, he wanted to uh, go to a school of agriculture. And uh, of course, Brookings, the uh, land grant college, had the best school of agriculture. And uh, he went there and he felt really at home with other young people who were, had farm and ranch backgrounds. He uh, wanted to specialize in poultry chicken production, egg production. He had a fascination with chickens going back to his young childhood. And uh, he could always uh, tell one kind of chicken, one breed of chicken from another. Wherever he traveled in the world, he noticed what chickens were prevalent in that locale. When he traveled across the United States, he always noticed what, uh, chick what eggs were selling for in that locality. And he always seemed to think that uh, South Dakotans were not getting enough uh, for their eggs compared to, to other uh, egg producers across the United States. And he did uh, indeed uh, graduate with uh, a degree, a bachelor's degree in agriculture. And on campus, one of the things he put a lot of time into was he was president of the uh, local, the South Dakota State 
poultry club. And I uh, took that very seriously. Uh, the other reason, uh, that's the first reason he went, uh, was to get that education in agriculture and poultry. Uh, another reason was he wanted to play football at South Dakota State. And uh, he had made a name for himself as a high school football player in Belfouche. And he was confident that he could go to Brookings and, and make the team, and he did. Uh, in fact, he became the team center. And uh, in 1939, the Jack Rabbits won the conference title. And that was a big, big thrill for Don. Now, the thing about Don is uh, he always described himself, and his letters were preserved that he wrote mostly to his parents, as uh, a guy who always kind of felt socially just a little bit on the outside, socially just a little bit awkward. He said, I'm a loner. I, I, I'm not good in groups. But there were two things that uh, were exceptions to that. He loved the teamwork of a football team, and he became a leader on that team. And that translated very definitely when he got into the Army and started uh, being in crews aboard airplanes. He loved that kind of camaraderie, too. And he had a real leadership uh, ability to him. Um, the other thing I can say about his time at South Dakota State, we know that he uh, he joined a lot of uh, fraternities, but again, he'd write home and say, I just always kind of feel like the outsider at those fraternities. Uh, I don't know if he uh, went to dances. I, uh, I'll tell you why I've worried about, I've wondered about his dance ability, um, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, I've, I've wondered about his dancing ability. I haven't worried about it. I misspoke there. Uh, we'll come to that in a little bit. He, uh, his identity really uh, on the South Dakota State campus was football player, member of this 1939 team. And in fact, he made the sports headlines across South Dakota. And when the season is over, that uh, conference winning uh, season, he was named Little All-American. Uh, which was a great honor. And uh, Little All-American was, now we just call it All-American, but this was for uh, uh, students at smaller schools. Uh, he was a remarkable athlete. Third reason he went to uh, South Dakota State was it gave him the ability to join Army Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTC. And he decided he was gonna put himself through college on an ROTC scholarship. That meant that he would go into the Army uh, after graduating as a first lieutenant. And I really have to stress that Don in 1936, when he got involved with uh, um, ROTC, did not think he was signing up for a wartime Army. And in fact, he desperately hoped that the United States would not get involved in World War II. Uh, he was, a, he was a, an isolationist in that way. And in one letter he wrote, uh, what are we supposed to do? Ruin our lives because the rest of the world can't get along with itself? He, uh, he wrote a lot and read a lot about the dangers of the United States going to war and really hoped it wouldn't happen. When it did happen, uh, he did his duty though. And, uh, and of course, many would say went far beyond his, his duty. Um, I look at this picture, and I, I show this picture sometimes, and, and people think, okay, there's a guy, uh, outstanding football player, somebody who went on to be a true war hero. He must have just been this kind of gung-ho, let's go get him kind of guy. Not at all. Not that kind of personality at all. Uh, I asked everybody I came into contact with, uh, what, what was he like as a person? And they all said, quiet respectful. Uh, one of his friends at South Dakota State said, Don, the only way Don could have had an enemy was to go out and buy one. He, uh, his cousin said he was always a gentleman, even when he was a little kid, always very, very curious. Ed Saylor, who was his engineer on the Doolittle Raid flight, said uh, he was a straight arrow. He said, that's the best way to describe him, a straight arrow. Uh, didn't like it when the boys got too rowdy. Didn't like uh, drinking too much. Um, you know, he, he was just uh, a very respectful, quiet kind of person. 
Well, he graduated from Brookings uh, June 1940, and he went to uh, Oxnard, California. And he went to an army facility there at the uh, air, airport in Oxnard. And he took, uh, he took coursework related to aviation, physics related to aviation, weather studies, and uh, everything you'd need to know academically to, to be a pilot. And he also got to uh, fly little uh, airplanes, single engine airplanes that he called crop dusters. And uh, the reason for doing that was uh, the Army was curious who was going to get air sick. And, uh, you know, they couldn't even consider you as a pilot if you got air sick. And Don said, uh, I never got air sick, not once in my life. And he said, I'm sorry, but sometimes I guess I didn't have a lot of sympathy for, for men who did get air sick. It just was something that, that did not affect me. Uh, his academic work and the fact that he didn't get air sick uh, prompted the Army to send him to San Antonio, Texas. Uh, went to the Randolph base there, and especially Kelly Field within that base, to learn to fly bombers. And uh, he was a fast study. He learned to fly bombers in about a five-month period, uh, late 1940, early 1941, in San Antonio. The other thing that happened to him in San Antonio was he met a young woman, Marie Crouch, and they had a rural whirlwind of a romance, and they were married only four months later. And uh, looking at Don's character, I think it's the only impulsive thing that I knew that he ever did. Uh, he just fell hard for this young woman uh, she, who was a native of uh, San Antonio, and they were married. And, you know, actually it was not uncommon in those years leading up for, to World War II for those relationships to to develop very quickly. Uh, you know, by this time, even though Don didn't want war to happen, he knew there was a chance. And a lot of those people, it's like, you know, if we're going to go to war, we need to get the other parts of our life uh, going, going fast here. Uh, so a lot of good things happened to him in San Antonio. He uh, earned his wings as a bomber pilot. Uh, he uh, married Marie Crouch. And uh, then he was asked, after he he got his wings, where would you like to be stationed? And uh, his reply on a form was, as close to Belfouche, South Dakota as possible. Now this was just about a year before the development of Air Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, so that wasn't an option, but he uh, put in for uh, a base down in Colorado. And uh, he didn't get that. They sent him instead up to McCord Field in Tacoma, Washington which he thought was okay. That was close enough to South Dakota. He could maybe drive back uh, during his, his breaks, during leave. So he went to Tacoma and what he didn't know was happening in Tacoma and he'd been selected to be a part of was to be uh, to test the brand new B-25 bomber uh, produced by North American Air Aviation. Uh, the B-25 was state of the art at the time. It was a four motor, uh, or excuse me, a two motor uh, plane, very fast, carried a crew of five, and it needed crews who would do kind of test runs out of uh, Tacoma to see if all systems were working. The one system that wasn't working too well was sometimes the landing gear didn't come down on the early B-25s. So all of those crews had to worry about what do we do? Do we try for a crash landing? Uh, if, if the landing gear doesn't come down, do we go up high, up to 10,000 feet and bail out? You know, how do we get out of this uh, dysfunctional machine if something goes wrong with the landing gear? Uh, Don knew other crews who made crash landings. Uh, his crew decided they would do a crash landing rather than bail out, uh, but they never had to do it. And uh, finally, that and some other uh, kinks in the B-25 were, were worked out. And uh, Don was probably the most proficient pilot uh, of B-25s in the United States by the end of summer 1941. And that fall, he went off to war. Not, not the war you're thinking of yet, but rather the great mock war that the United States Army uh, staged down in the Southern states. First in Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, 
uh, and then they moved up to North Carolina and South Carolina. And it was uh, it involved uh, aviators, also ground troops. Uh, Don wrote about how much he loved dropping a flare and you know lighting up the whole countryside and seeing the ground troops uh, moving across across the country. Uh, he uh, saw tanks, including most likely the tanks uh, that uh, General Patton was uh, uh, working with in uh, the Carolinas at that time. Uh, he writes about attacking one day in his B-25, the bridges of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And what that meant was uh, you dropped one pound uh, bags of flour at your targets. And any vehicle or any person that got splattered with flour, they were, they were out of the fight uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, so, um, he really was, he was, he was uh, learning quickly, you know, how to get around the country fast, how to get a plane and a crew up and into a combat zone. At that time, a mock combat zone, but uh, he grew confidence in doing that. Marie, uh, his wife, actually uh, tried to kind of keep up with him. Uh, she would get a hotel uh, in different places in the, in the south or uh, uh, an apartment for a week or so, uh, so they could be together during his time during the mock war in the South. In December, the mock war was over. He flew a plane back to San Antonio. From there, they flew and uh, spent the night in Tucson, Arizona. On December 7th, 1941, he, uh, he started flying back to the Pacific Northwest and uh, they got news in the air that Pearl Harbor had, uh, had been attacked. And he knew instantly that his life had changed, that now he was uh, going into a real war. He wrote his dad and uh, said, I have a nice blue suit that I think I'd like to give you because I don't think I'll be anything but military clothes until this war is over. And the blue suit he was talking about was the one uh, photographed uh, in a senior uh, portrait uh, that I started out this presentation with. Uh, so he went back to uh, McCord and also he was at uh, Pendleton, Camp Pendleton. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, another uh, base in, uh, in Oregon. Um, yeah, Pendleton, where the Pendleton Rodeo is. And uh, the, the guys were flying uh, patrols out over the Pacific looking for enemy submarines. And in fact, they did spot one, one of his uh, colleagues uh, bombed and destroyed a submarine, Japanese submarine off the coast of uh, Washington. Um, and then they got word that uh, the famous Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was looking for volunteers for a secret mission, a dangerous mission. He said, as dangerous as anything you'll ever do in your life. And uh, couldn't tell them much more about that, except he wanted to involve B-25s in this mission. And Don, Don signed up for it. And uh, for a long, long time, these guys had no idea what the mission was, but they went to train for it first in North Carolina and then at Pensacola, Florida. And all of the training stressed flying fast, flying low, and uh, they uh, were flying bombers. And they were terrified to think that they were gonna fly fast, low to a certain target and that they were gonna drop those bombs at a low altitude, because then the risk was, you know, the repercussions would, would tear the plane apart after the bomb uh, went off. But uh, Doolittle still would not tell them what, what it was. They, they, did, they were left to guess. And Doolittle told them, don't guess, you know, you'll know soon enough, you'll get all the information that you need shortly. So really February, they were tra training in uh, North Carolina. Uh, most of the month of Florida of uh, March, they were in Florida. Uh, they were going to hit a target. They were going to fly across the water somewhere. They didn't know where, uh, and they were they were supposed to fly really low. So they would take off from Pensacola and they'd fly across the Gulf of Mexico in rehearsal for this mission that they were going to do, uh, aiming for Houston, Texas, pretending that Houston was their target. 
they fly just barely over the top of the, of the waves. And uh, see Houston, that was their target. They turn around there and go back to Pensacola, Florida. So they were learning uh, low altitude aviation. They were learning navigation uh, over the Gulf of Mexico with uh, Houston in their, in their sights. They called flying low, hugging the deck. And it was something that uh, do a little stressed over and over, keep low. Finally, the end of March, they were told they were gonna fly across the United States to San Francisco, and they were gonna load their B-25s on uh, an aircraft carrier, the Hornet. And now they realized they were gonna take, take off from an aircraft carrier, Nothing, something that had never been done with land planes before. A B-25 usually needed a, a thousand feet of runway to get in the air. Uh, they were told they would have less than 500. Uh, they loaded up the, the planes onto the Hornet, started uh, across the Pacific, and it wasn't until they were out in the Pacific for a day that they found out what their mission was, and that was to take off from the Hornet and hit uh, targets across Japan. And up to that point, Doolittle was still saying, you know, this is such a dangerous mission. If anybody wants out, they can get out. and uh, and uh, he meant it. Uh, there had been somebody, a couple people who got out uh, when they were still in Florida, frustrated, I guess, that they weren't getting information about what their mission was. Um, but they were still able to say, I'm not gonna fly this mission when they were on board the, the Hornet headed for Japan. At that point though, nobody dropped out. Now Don had, uh, he had a saying that he often used in describing things that the uh, Army Air Corps was doing. He would say, it's strictly routine. What we did worked well, it was strictly routine. That was a favorite phrase of his. But in fact, for the attack against the Japanese on April 18th, uh, 1942, nothing was routine. Actually, even before that, uh, going across the, uh, the Pacific, they hit storms. It was just, it was hard on the planes that were uh, out in the open. Um, Don Smith, which his crew dubbed TNT, all of a sudden it had an engine failure. And uh, uh, it was like parallel to uh, a transmission loss. And uh, Don's engineer, Ed Saylor, had to take the whole motor off the plane and reassemble it. Uh, and then they didn't know there was no way to do a test flight. Sounded good when they started up, but they didn't know if it was going to be good in the air. Uh, and uh, Ed Saylor, I, I got to actually talk to him on the phone. Remarkable guy who did this. Uh, gave me so much insight into uh, Don Smith. Uh, but 20 years old, and he did this complete engine repair on the B-25. When it was time to take off, um, was it, this was not strictly routine, but Don's plane wouldn't budge. He revved it up and it wouldn't move forward. Uh, turned out the uh, Navy man had forgotten to take the block under his wheels out. They had removed that and, and it took off fine. And, uh, but the thing that was really not routine was the fact that the men found out suddenly they had 400 more miles to fly. They were gonna take off early because uh, the uh, Hornet had spotted a Japanese ship and I thought it was, a, it was probably radio in that uh, uh, there was this ship with all these planes visible on the deck and uh, that uh, if they were gonna do a surprise attack, they had to take off like right now, early Saturday, April 18th. And uh, so they took off, but having to fly those extra miles meant they had fuel for sure to get to Japan uh, they didn't have fuel, most likely, to get out of Japan across the China Sea to a landing point in China. And so what had started out as a, a really dangerous mission now almost looked suicidal. I asked Ed Sailor about that, and he said, well, yeah, it looks suicidal, but, uh, you know, there was a good chance we were going to get shot down anyway. 
a good chance we wouldn't get the plane off the deck. So it was just one more complication. Um, as it turned out, they, uh, they got the planes off the deck just fine. Um, Don got his uh, B-25 up in the air in uh, less than 300 feet, the shortest takeoff of the day. And uh, knowing about Don's mind, I know what he was thinking when he got word that he had taken off in less than 300 feet, less than the length of a football field, less than the field at the uh, state field in, uh, in Brookings. Uh, I always say that, as far as I can tell, Don Smith flew a perfect mission that day, found his targets, had that great takeoff, which everybody was impressed by, uh, found his targets and uh, hit them in Kobe, Japan. He was hitting uh, four factories uh, that supplied uh, airplanes or airplane parts. And uh, the, the whole a uh, group of B-25s was, uh, was helped by a uh, wind that suddenly was blowing to the west. And so they turned out they did have fuel to get to China, to China but only barely. In fact, uh, Don ditched into the water, finally made one of those crash landings that he and his crew had talked about so much off the coast of China. And uh, then they had about a half a mile to swim into, uh, into shore actually on the shore of an island off the coast of China. Uh, all the planes that time, none of them touched down on a regular air, airfield. Uh, well, except one, I'll tell you about that. But uh, everybody had to either crash land into the China countryside, middle of the night, or they had to bail out. Uh, three of the raiders died that night, uh, two drowned in a crash landing, uh, one went died when his, his parachute didn't, uh, didn't open. Five were quickly captured by the Japanese. One crew, uh, to the anger of, of Doolittle, flew uh, off course to Siberia and touched down uh, in Siberia, much to the anger of both Doolittle and, uh, and Stalin, who didn't want to have anything to do with this, uh, this raid. And that's a whole different story. But the other 15 crews, all of a sudden, uh, they were in China, and uh, they had to find a, a rendezvous point with the help of uh, Chinese citizens that they found. And actually, in writing the book, this was my favorite part of writing the book, researching the escape from China. Um, and uh, Ed Saylor helped me a lot with that, and so did David Thatcher, who walked out with, uh, with Don. It was about a three, three and a half week uh, journey from where Don and his crew came down to uh, Chongqing, China, where they met up with the other raiders. Uh, one of the, the things they had difficulty was uh, they, they had taken some Chinese language courses on, aboard the Hornet. None of those words helped them a lot. It was a, 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 a whole different dialect that they had in the part of China where they were. My favorite story that David Thatcher told me was uh, um, he said, we were five guys in this crew. We were walking across China by day, usually along rice paddies. And yes, we were being pursued by Japanese who came in and were hunting for us. Um, and we'd walk all day and we'd come to a village and the kids of that village would see five tall Americans. And they thought, hey, it's an American basketball team. We need to work up a game and uh, play these Americans real game of American basketball. And those crewmen were, uh, you know, their feet were sore. Uh, you know, the last thing they wanted to do was play a basketball game in these villages. Plus they're trying to keep low, keep a low profile because the Japanese were after them. But they always said, yeah, we'll, we'll play you a game. And there was always a crowd that uh, gathered around. And, uh, and I said, uh, you know, I wondered two things in writing this book. Was Don a good dancer? All of his friends in Belfouche remember him being a really good dancer, uh, but he was very hesitant to dance at formal army affairs because uh, he thought his his dancing was not up to uh, up to those standards. 
Uh, finally, when he met Marie, it didn't matter. She was going to be his dance partner for the rest of his life. But David Thatcher asked me, he said, you know, I played those basketball games with Don in China. He said, do you know, did he play basketball in high school at Belfouche or at South Dakota State? Because he was a really good basketball player. And so I dug into the files. I, I found out quickly he had not played at uh, Belfouche High School. He was always worried of they would injure an ankle and uh, not be able to play football. So he pretty much avoided other sports. Found out that finally, when the last football season was done at South Dakota State, he joined an intramural basketball team uh, and, and played in a tournament and was so good that he actually made, uh, he was got honorable mention out of 250 men uh, as uh, all tournament player. I think that's the only time he ever played a real formal game of basketball until he got to China. And he was a good enough athlete, I think that if he hadn't played uh, at stayed in this in a role, like it wouldn't have mattered. He could just pick up a basketball or any sort of a piece of sporting equipment and figure it out and, and be good. Um, they finally got their Chung King and uh, he got on a plane and he and members of his crew flew around the world, flew uh, back to Washington, D.C. Uh, from the West and uh, made stops in Egypt and other places. Uh, it was in Egypt that they found out that their photos were plastered all over uh, the current issue of Life magazine. They were really being hailed as American heroes. Uh, they didn't know that anybody had really taken notice uh, of them until that point. He uh, got to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, he was presented in Washington with his other uh, uh, fellow Raiders, the Distinguished Flying Cross at Washington, D.C. And then he had some leave time. He got on a train in Washington and headed back to South Dakota. He wanted to do three things uh, during this leave time. One was to visit Brookings, reconnect with his classmates there, and uh, I don't think he knew it when he got on the train, but his uh, classmates were going to convene a special meeting of the poultry club and, reckon, and welcome back uh, their former poultry club president, Don Smith. Uh, he was going to do a talk at the Dudley Hotel in downtown Brookings uh, that was open to the public. So he got on the train, got to Brookings, uh, uh, first day of July, 1942. Um, met all his professors, all of his uh, poultry club members, gave his talk at the Dudley Hotel, got on a train and headed uh, west now to Belfouche, where a similar presentation uh, was scheduled at the Don Pratt Hotel in, uh, in Belfouche. And uh, in describing the Doolittle Raid for his South Dakota friends, uh, Don knew he was, new, he was known across the state as a football player. So he used some uh, football metaphors. One of the things he said was, uh, well, it was, it was uh, like the old sleeper play in football, and we caught them napping, which indeed was the most amazing thing uh, about the whole raid for Don was that he had hit Kobe an hour after uh, Doolittle had hit Tokyo, and it was like nobody, even with an hour passing, in good uh, communications across China, nobody expected him to come in with his B-25. So it was, in his mind, a sleeper play, and he caught them napping. The other thing he uh, addressed, uh, both in Brookings and uh, um, Belfouche, was propaganda that the Japanese put out that Smith had bombed a hospital in Kobe, which we later established was not true. And he was really angry that angry that uh, the Japanese would say that. Uh, and he said, uh, well, he said, if that, was, if that was a hospital, it was the first to ever have airplanes coming out of it. Because, of course, it was a factory making airplanes. Um, after uh, his time in South Dakota, he was also kind of the uh, guest of honor for the 1942 uh, Black Hills Roundup Rodeo in Belfouche, and he gave some remarks at the uh, at the rodeo too. 
They got on a bus and headed south to San Antonio because uh, Marie was about to give birth to a daughter. And uh, it was a slow trip by bus. He was hoping he could find an airplane to get aboard, uh, but uh, that didn't work out. So he took a bus from uh, Belfouche to uh, San Antonio and actually missed the birth of his uh, daughter by uh, about 24 hours. Uh, he had uh, more leave time to spend with his daughter and wife in San Antonio. And then he was off, sent by the Army, the summer of 1942, to learn to fly uh, the new plane that was going to actually replace, in some places, the B-25. That was the B-26. B-26 was a difficult plane to learn to, to fly. Uh, it had a tendency, again, in its early uh, stages, although this was, was fixed, for its uh, propellers to get out of, uh, out of uh, coordination with one another. And that would send the plane into a, a spin that was really hard to pull out of. And in fact, a lot of aviators really hated the B-26. They said the B-25 was just a delight, a, delight, a very forgiving plane uh, to fly. You could correct a mistake, but not with the B-26. And uh, some of the uh, Army uh, flyers had a saying because they were doing a lot of their training in uh, Tampa, Florida. And uh, their saying was, one a day in Tampa Bay, because there were so many crashes of the B-26. It wasn't really uh, one a day, but it could have been about one a week. Um, so he was, uh, he was training himself to fly the B-26. He was also flying uh, newer pilots to fly the B-26. And, uh, you know, he was a veteran of the Doolittle Raid, and, uh, but he had only been a pilot himself at that point for about a year and a half. But he was a good teacher and uh, taught a lot, of, a lot of other men to fly both the B-25 and the, the B-26. In uh, October 1942, uh, he and uh, many other aviators, flyers of the B-25, uh, flew across the Atlantic to England, and uh, there were still men that he was working with who needed to get more hours to be proficient on the B-26. So they were in England for several weeks, and it was there that they found out they were going to be a part of the uh, force that would uh, fight in North Africa to take back North Africa from uh, German forces. But uh, sadly, Don never got there. Uh, he perished in a plane crash on November 12, 1942, uh, just outside of London. Uh, news got back to the United States. It, it hit his dad, uh, Dr. Smith, the veterinarian, very hard. And in fact, his dad had a stroke and died just uh, six weeks after his son uh, on Christmas Eve, 1942. Um, so his daughter grew up without knowing her, her father. Uh, I really hope that I could, uh, in writing this book, talk to both his daughter and uh, his wife, Marie, if she was still alive. And they were both very ill at the time that I started to write the book. So I never got to talk to, to either of them. Uh, Marie died in 2005, um, uh, Donna, his daughter, in 2001. I did, however, get to talk to uh, several new little raiders, and they're all gone now. And that was a great honor for me to, uh, to meet those men, two of them in person, uh, one a, a phone interview. Um, when I was on uh, Lori Walsh's public radio show a few weeks ago, she asked me, was there one thing you really regretted that uh, was just a, a source of information you, you were not able to get? My great regret in writing this book was 1978, when I was living in Spearfish, Jimmy Doolittle decided to have one of his uh, Raider reunions, which they had every year in April in Rapid City. Uh, they were hosted by Ellsworth Air Force Base. They had public programming at the Rapid City uh, Civic Center. They all went to Mount Rushmore and posed for photos up there. And uh, there were about, oh, 20, 25 Raiders who were there and they were just there to talk one day to historians who were interested in knowing their story. 
I don't know what I was doing in June 1978, but I didn't go to Rapid City. I, I at that time I had no interest really in the Doolittle raid. I uh, didn't even know that there were two South Dakotans who had flown it, and so uh, I blew right by that opportunity. But uh, anyway, later I was able to catch up with some of the raiders. Uh, I'm so grateful to Don's family, both uh, his adopted family uh, and uh, his natural family for the time they gave and really sharing insight into him. And uh, it was kind of surprising how quickly Don Smith was forgotten after the war. Um, I'm really hoping that this book uh, brings back his story and, and makes South Dakota curious and proud of Don Smith. So that's my talk. I'd be uh, open to any questions. Okay. SD Festival of Books, can we unmute people and let them have their video, see if people have questions? Anybody? Well, I have one. Yes. I, what does a poultry club do? <laughs> poultry club. You know, I, I talked a lot of book groups. And when I say he was president of the poultry club, uh, they misunderstand me and they think I said he was president of the SD, SC uh, poetry, poetry club. It's like, oh, he's a poet. As a matter of fact, he's a pretty good writer. I didn't see any poetry they wrote. But poultry club, uh, they, they were real interested in a couple of things during his time. They were real interested in learning all the different kinds of chickens and how with uh, what they call scientific farming, it might be possible to increase egg production, increase weight on chickens. And they were real interested in the process of uh, sexing chickens, determining what sex a uh, new chick was. And it's interesting, the, the research that was really leading the way was out of Japan at that time. So they were studying uh, research about sexing chickens. Uh, they, they just really thought they were at a, a point in agriculture where they're going to be able to produce a wider range of chickens, uh, prompt them to produce more eggs and uh, heavier chickens for, for, uh, for meat. So interesting. <laughs> okay, does anyone else have a question? No other questions? Well, I'll, I'll ask another one then. Did, um, did any of his survivors ever go to China to see where he landed? Or, yeah. you know? I'm really glad you asked that because somebody who really wanted to do that and did it, I think on two occasions, was the other South Dakotan, Hank Potter. Oh, and they wow. did go back and it was a very emotional reunion for Hank. He met a man who uh, was a teacher who spoke English, who really helped them that morning after they had, uh, in, in his case, Hank's case, he parachuted into China. And uh, he was just wandering out there on a cold morning, uh, didn't know where in, in the world he was. And uh, they were very, very grateful to those people who, who helped them. And so, yes, some of them did go back. Hank Potter especially went back and uh, was very moved by the experience. And not to end this on too much of a down downer, but a lot of the people that they encountered, and I don't think, I know Don never knew this. It came out after the war, but they were slaughtered by the Japanese. Uh, if they found that they had been in their village, if they had played a basketball game with them, if they had given their children American coins, um, many, many people died because they helped the Doolittle Raiders. Wow. We do have a question um, yeah. from, uh, from Darren. Where is Don buried? Is it overseas or was his body brought back here? He was first buried in England and then uh, 1948 they moved the body uh, back to Belfouche and he's at uh, Pine Slope Cemetery in Belfouche. And that was a big deal. I mean, when he came, his body was brought back, uh, Belfouche, the Belfouche mayor got a, uh, a letter from the mayor of New York City, um, you know, just thanking them and saying that he hoped he could visit the grave site sometime. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Interesting. And finally, um, Brenda asked a question, where is Hank Potter from? She missed the beginning. I believe you said Peer, correct? Yeah, he's from Peer, and, and Hank lived a long life, lived into his 90s. As I said, he, uh, he uh, traveled uh, back to China. Uh, he was a very high-ranking officer in the U.S. Air Force, uh, mostly stationed in Texas, and uh, he made Texas his home. Uh, like Don, he had married a woman from Texas, and uh, you know that happened to a lot of people who trained in Texas. They ended up marrying women there, and then they lived in Texas. And so we always assumed that Don would have come back to uh, South Dakota after the war if he had survived, but I don't know. Uh, Marie was pretty... He was a Texas girl. He might have ended up down there. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We are um, we're out of time, Paul. We really appreciate the uh, the research you did. Your book must be fascinating. Um, I hope all the participants here will consider going to the Zambros link and and buying a book and learning more about Don. Um, and uh, I guess just thank you again so very very much. And you're welcome. I hope all of you enjoy uh, the rest of the festival. There are a lot more activities today and tomorrow and on into October. It's a great festival. Karen, thanks for your help this morning. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.